you know, there was something magical about that feedback loop of actually seeing customers use the product um, that you had built that just, again, reinforced the whole loop about if you can spend more time in the creation on the things that really matter to your customers, uh, you get so much more value out of that. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who have made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Christina Warren, Senior uh, Developer Advocate at GitHub. And I'm Kevin Scott. And I'm so excited. We have such a, a great guest today. We have Phil Spencer, who is the CEO of gaming at Microsoft. Yeah, it, I it, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, like, I, I had to, like, wear, like, the merch. I had to wear, like, the, the band shirt to the, to the band concert for, for anybody who is, is watching uh, our video feed of this. I am so excited to hear your conversation with Phil. Yeah, Phil is uh, Phil is one of my favorite people, and he has such a great job and has had such a such a great career. I mean, like honestly, they, there there aren't that many people who have loved the thing that they are one of the industry leaders in ever since they were a kid, and like at every step of the way, like he is uh, taking this love of what. Uh, yeah, you know, of video games and uh, just turn that into like a super interesting career at, at every step of the way. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't wait, but let's go ahead and let's get into your conversation with Phil. Awesome. Phil Spencer is the CEO of Microsoft Gaming. He began his career at Microsoft as an intern in 1988, and since then he's done many, many things to benefit the gaming community, like pushing for cross-platform play, pioneering backwards compatibility within the Xbox line of consoles, and launching Game Pass. And as a heads up to you listeners, Phil and I know each other pretty well. We've been on Microsoft's senior leadership team together for several years, and you may have seen us gaming together recently for the Build Conference. That was a ton of fun. It's so great to have you on the show today, Phil. It's good to be here, Kevin. Thanks for having me. So the way that we usually start these conversations is by going all the way back to childhood. And uh, I'd love to understand, like, how you got interested in technology, math, science, like whatever it was that got you on this journey. Yeah, it's interesting. I think uh, for me, it probably centers on my parents uh, who were kind of early investors in things I was interested in. Um, I grew up, I don't know if it's like a lot of kids, but as a comic book reading, D&D playing, video game playing uh, kid, my wife likes to say that I haven't changed much in, in the years. That's kind of still <laughs> who I am. Uh, but I remember my, my family bringing home, first it was a, a Pong machine back in the day, showing my age, um, and then Atari 2600, and really getting interested in video games in my home. The arcade down the street, my friends would ride, we'd ride our bikes down and uh, play Robotron, Galaga, the games of the day, and had a ton of fun. And I remember when I got my 2600 at home, there literally was this question in my mind if I would ever leave the house again, or was this gonna be <laughs> the, the end of me? Um, my dad, who was a chemical engineer uh, by trade, so into tech and, um, as in his workplace, computers were playing more of a role, brought a computer home, Sinclair ZX81. Uh, we brought it home as the first machine I ever had. Uh, we started typing in programs from the back of like Compute Magazine and buying uh, books of code, you know, basic programs that we would type in. I kind of learned to code debugging my typos or misprints um, in those magazines took some classes at school when I was in junior high on the Apple II, that was kind of the thing. Uh, and then I ended up in high school working in a video game store, Computer Mart in Vancouver, Washington, uh, sitting behind the desk and you know families would come in, whether they had like a Commodore or an Atari or a PC and wanting to buy video games or buy a system. 
And it was a cool opportunity for me to just kind of be along with different people who had come in on their journey, what was interesting to them. I was playing most of the games in the store, so I was, I was kind of a reference for uh, what people wanted to play. Um, and that kind of continued to when I joined University of Washington as a student my freshman year in the engineering department. And then, uh, luckily enough, my second year, my sophomore year, uh, a kid who lived two doors down from me, Tai Yi, uh, his dad was a vice president at Microsoft in the CD-ROM group. And he saw some of the video game stuff I was doing on the Atari 20, uh, Atari ST would have been, and uh, said, you should come over and to Microsoft. This was kind of pre-Windows 3, and we're doing some things on CD. We think pictures and animations and stuff will be one of the new media types. They were just starting to create the multimedia division. And that was my internship in uh, 1988 in the CD-ROM group slash multimedia group. Um, and it's been a crazy, what now, 34 years since. That's awesome. And, and like, I, I mean, it, it may be an unusual uh, path, but I don't think it's unusual for folks of uh, your generation and mine. Because like all of those things that you said, Dungeons and Dragons, playing comic book reading, uh, <laughs> you know, video game loving, like, yeah, you know, right, right here too. And like so many of us uh, had that mix of things uh, that led us into the computing industry, um, yeah, just completely random. Like when you got your twenty six hundred, uh, what was your favorite uh, favorite set of games that you were playing? Well, so now you're going to get me in uh, game geekdom, so uh, I, I will apologize in advance. I think, like a lot of people, uh, when I first got the twenty six hundred, I was obviously attracted to the games I had played in the arcades. So you had Space Invaders, you had um, Missile Command, and then pretty quickly you realize that people who were actually building dedicated games for the 2600, taking advantage of the input devices that that machine had as opposed to the multiple sticks and buttons of like a Defender or something at the arcades, that people who were crafting unique games uh, were the ones that were really doing more interesting things. And those are the ones I gravitated to, like your adventure type games. Um, and because people knew that, okay, I've got this, this joystick, one button, or one of the rotating with one button, and they built handcraft experience. So going in, of course, I was gonna be interested in the things I was paying a quarter for down at the local arcade. In the end, what I really glommed onto was the, the, the creators who looked at this specific device and created some, some of the you know, great games that are out there. Um, and still, like you think about Pitfall and some of these things back in the yep. day that were just fantastic, fantastic games. Well, and I mean, I guess the interesting thing about a game like Pitfall, for instance, is not only designed for the particular capabilities of the 2600, it's sort of different from a coin-operated arcade game in the sense that it's designed for you to explore and like you, you, you're not having to pump quarters into your, uh, into your machine at home. Like you own the thing and you can play for as long as you want to. Uh, and like that was really a, a big different modality, I think, between the home console machines and the, the coin-op machines, right? You know, it's funny that we're talking about this now because I still bring this up with the teams. The fact that your business model around your video game is not an afterthought. It's actually core to the, core, the design of the game, or I would even say an application that anybody is building. Um, and not to bring it back to Xbox right now because I'm sure we'll get there. But I think about diversity of business models on our platform is actually part of the creative tool set that our creators have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're spot on, and I use this analogy quite a bit, that in some ways the, the coin arcades were the first free-to-play games, right? They, were, they weren't exactly free, but what they were trying to do is they built this compulsion loop around digesting quarters into these cabinets and the core dynamic of the game, both its difficulty ramp and a bunch of things was totally created around that business model and rightfully so. I mean, creators should get paid uh, for the work that they're doing. And when then all of a sudden you got home and you're spending 40, 50 bucks for a 2600 cartridge, 
you didn't want that same experience, right? You, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, it's still part of the conversation today of what is free to play, what is a retail game, what is a subscription game. The fact that the business model is such a core part of the creation process is, uh, is, is, is as true today as it was 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, and it was always fascinating to me as a kid to look at things that um, were beautifully crafted things where they just didn't work because of the business model. So, if so, for instance, like the ones that I'm thinking about are Space Ace and uh, yeah. Dragon's Lair, like yeah. just the most gorgeous uh, sure. things, more like interactive stories and video games. And, and laser they, based, yeah, absolutely, yeah, and and they just didn't work for me because like you had to stuff so many damn quarters into the machine to like see the story unfold whereas it could have been a much more enjoyable experience if it hadn't been tied to the notion that you had to like pump quarters in at at a like frequent pace it's so smart and it's actually this intersection of i would say three things it's the device that you need to go play that because the next question would be well why didn't those just become 2600 games yeah or whatever it would have been at the time atari 800 whatever the right machine would have been vic 20 commodore 64 well the problem was that we didn't have laser discs at home right and the visual fidelity um, of those machines or the storage capacity of the cartridges or floppies that we were using. There's no way they were going to hold that amount of linear video content. So you had, well, you had to have a big cabinet because you got a laser disc inside of this thing, which then challenges the business model because somebody's walking in. They're not going to sit there for three hours in front of the machine. And you're absolutely right. This, how does device influence creative? And their creative was amazing for the time. These fully animated video games and the business model. I mean, it's still, it's it's as relevant, as I said, today, that same discussion. What device am I playing on? What technical capabilities does it have? What device, what business models are prevalent? And then obviously the creative capability of the creators is is, is at the core. So do you remember the first program that you wrote? So you were interested in video games. Uh, yeah, there's some period of time between when you get your first console and when you get go off to UW. Uh, so how much programming did you do between the two? It was constant. I mean, it. Uh, my first program that I ever wrote was probably Lemonade Stand in the seventh grade as part of my before school like computer club where you'd go in at 7 a.m. before the classes would open. I think it was an Apple II. And, you know, the, the instructor, who was actually pretty good, would write up, here's what I want your program to do. Now, it's all text-based, mm-hmm. but, you know, it's at least running math models uh, and then once I started working at Computer Mart, we'd actually have some of the game creators come by the store because we were kind of big enough in a local area around Portland, Oregon, that I would meet people that were actually working on games. So we get the opportunity to kind of help out with things like installers and little things. And that's that was kind of my production work uh, for the longest time through high school. When I got to college, it was obviously all about writing compilers and, um, you know, kind of real CS code as opposed to the the stuff that I, I was kind of doing, and frankly, getting a real training on what is a pointer and like, you know, just real linear algebra math, doing 3D transformations for, for 3D games. I mean, these were, that was my, my real learning. But yeah, early on, it was kind of, here's a problem, uh, go write something that works. And, and I love that iterative process. Um, yeah. I miss it many days. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that uh, I I talk with uh, people a lot about. Like there there was this beautiful thing about the simplicity of the machines that we had when we were growing up. Um, I mean, they didn't seem simple to me at the time, but in retrospect, uh, yeah, they they were not that difficult to approach no. and start doing stuff on. Whereas it's a the tools are way, way, way more powerful now, and the, the machines are way more powerful, but uh, you also have a lot more stuff to get your head wrapped around uh, if you want to claim that you have mastery over um, over your, your whole computing toolkit. I was just talking about this with somebody the other day where when I learned, I started from the bottoms up, meaning I learned assembler, and then through assembler, I learned what linkers do and what compilers did. So I was kind of working backwards from a high level language. And I remember when I started at Microsoft, working with some amazing developers, Todd Laney, these other guys who would, when I would write code, 
we would literally look at the output of the compiler to see what how well we thought the compiler did, and then obviously watch the linker. And you were, as you said, it was all so transparent to you, mm -hmm. the whole per, kind of pipeline to getting an XE. Um, I would say one of my maybe overstretches when I, I joined Microsoft was, if you know anything about like Amiga, Atari ST, uh, Apple II GS, these were all Motorola 68000 machines. Um, and when I got hired here, all of a sudden I'm on an Intel based 8086 and I'm like, I'm trying to, you know, learn a whole new instruction set. Um, and it was, uh, kind of as most things were back in the day, baptism by fire, um, in terms of code reviews and how stuff worked at Microsoft. But you're absolutely right. The transparency of how things not only were built, but also ran at runtime. Um, much different today, but frankly, the things that developers do today with, with writing code is well beyond what I think I would have ever gotten to. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, don't be so sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, I think one of the really interesting things technically about video games that was true then, and I think it's still true now, although you, you probably got a better beat on this than, than me, is that you, know, you, you were sort of forced into like really understanding all of the low level details of the machine because the things that you were trying to do were like right there on the bleeding edge of what the machines were capable of. You were just trying to wring every unit of performance out of absolutely. the machine. And that's still true, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, I would say one of the slight differences now with video games, well, let me say two things. One, most games that are built are targeting multiple platforms. Uh, from mobile, maybe all the way through a high-end gaming PC. So it requires a certain level of abstraction in how you're kind of building your game because you do expect that experience to flow. You know, we were talking about Minecraft just a minute ago. You know, Think about a game like that and the different target platforms that they have. It requires more abstraction in the code than, than maybe back in the day where you're building one game to run in one place. The other thing in a video game today is you know, a video game can easily reach 50, 60, 100 gigabytes of data. And, and the creation of the data is the most expensive part in building a video game. And all of that is animation, music, art assets. So the code itself, yes, you want it to run as effectively as it can and efficiently as it can. Um, but at the same time, it's not actually the critical path in getting a game done as effectively as you can. Tool chain and asset production is way more important. So we spend a lot of cycles actually on getting writing code to help us build a game as opposed to just running the game because the the running of the game itself is critical but when you think about getting that game done and making your creators on your team as effective as possible there's a lot more internal work that goes into building a video game than there has ever been before well yeah you know, maybe, maybe let's talk about that for a minute because um we, we've made reference to this uh teaser video that you and I made yeah, for um, for Microsoft's big developer conference build. And one of the things that that teaser video is trying to do is show people that, hey, we've got this AI abstraction layer now yeah. that you can use to uh, like help you do things like uh, make video games more interactive and enjoyable. Um, but like this point that you made about how uh, like the games themselves are so complex that you have to build layers of tooling to help manage this complex task of making a modern video game. So yeah, maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. So just for folks who know nothing about the gaming industry, like let, let's take a you know, top title, something like, uh, you know, Halo, for instance. Yeah. Uh, like, what does it take to make a game like that? Yeah, we well, are talking now when you think about all of the people involved in a creative process, whether it's the multiplayer, people playing with each other online or the single player, which in a lot of ways are games that share asset but are separate games from a creative design construct you might have a thousand people that are part of actually getting a game out the door. You're gonna spend 100, 200 million, maybe even $300 million to get a game done of what we call like kind of your top AAA franchises of today from us or, or a third party. Uh, I mean, it's, it's as big as any Hollywood blockbuster movie in terms of the production 
uh, cost of getting the game done. And maybe there's some ego in this statement as somebody who comes from the games industry. But I'll say the complexity is higher because you're kind of rewriting the film format while you're kind of creating the assets if you're doing engine work at the same time. So the runtime is is usually being evolved, if not created from scratch, while you're creating these assets. Um, and this is why I, I think your, your point about the use of machine learning and AI, there's always this draw from some of, hey, we can have more believable AI characters. We can have uh, kind of algorithmically created worlds that you can go and how cool would that be? And us in the games industry kind of come back to, and if we could just help me test this game, mm -hmm. you know, that would be such a huge, huge uh, breakthrough for us because um, it is as much about, when I say test, kind of validating the content, validating the scripts, validating the edge cases, of a game. These are the things as these games get so big uh, that are really, really the, the kind of depth of, of where time is spent. And frankly, a lot of variability is spent um, in ensuring a game gets done. We kind of know what it means to create a character or, or a world, at least, or a scene. You know, we'll do it a few times and now we've got a benchmark validating all of that content for the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of players before they get it. That is the part that is just kind of not infinitely complex, but close to it, I think. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's a it's a super good point around technology in general. Like, you know, you you and I love technology, yeah. uh, you know, for the sake of technology, we can sort of look at a thing and say, wow, this is interesting and cool and complicated and nuanced. But at the end of the day, like if, if the technology isn't in service of something that people want, it's, pretty, you know, pretty useful. And like the thing that you want in a video game is like a just a super compelling experience. It's got to have a good story that, you know, the characters have to be great. It has to be, you know, visually engaging. Like the, the music has to be, I was thinking about this the other day at, uh, you know, how big a difference it was, uh, you know, between the, you know, the 8-bit generation of games yeah. and the 16-bit generation, just the sound. Uh, yeah. And like, and you had to up-level uh, you had to up level the people who are contributing to the game because of the capability. Uh, you know, like the composition for like a game like Mario Brothers, for for instance. Like some of those are like musically sophisticated uh, compositions. Um, That's right. Yeah, I mean, full symphonies now are we're using all the time to rec record what we do in the video games. I'll say there's another layer that maybe players don't. If, if you don't dissect a video game, which you shouldn't do when you play, it should just be about the fun. There's also multiple layers of systems at work when you're playing a video game. You know, we we talk about video games and what is that kind of three seconds of fun? Like when I'm and that's the I have a controller, a keyboard and mouse or touch. And what is the thing that I do over and over and over? That's kind of just so compelling. And then I have another loop, which is maybe my five minutes of fun of like what gets me to keep playing and keep playing. And I feel challenged and I feel some growth in that. And then maybe over a five hour, one hour period or whatever, there's another kind of set of systems at play to keep me usually having to do with economies of like, I'm gaining this amount of experience points and what are the sinks of where I go spend at those and does that economy hold over the time? We have economists that are working on games that kind of helped us um, with these things. But the number of systems from a near-term control and, and, and not this isn't even talking about the creative of what is the story and do I feel connected to the challenge and the characters, but the amount of kind of engagement systems that are involved in a game and testing those out, is the game actually fun? What does that word even mean? And, uh, you know, these are things that game teams spend so much time on and there's high variability in it. Um, and I think there should be right at the core, while it's very technically based, I view video games as an art form and what makes a good painting, what makes a good song, what makes a, a good you know TV show. Um, that I think there's there's a lot of organic in that. So I, I think the first video game for me that hit all of those uh, all of those things that had the you know the three seconds, the five minute, the multi hour was probably uh, the original Legend of Zelda for the uh, yeah. for the NES. Yeah. Uh, and like I just remember getting it and like it was sort of instantaneously fun. And then you just couldn't put it down. My brother yeah. and I. I mean, we just we, we got it for Christmas one year and like we just disappeared like the entire yeah. Christmas vacation was like gone. Yeah. Like, do, do you remember like which the, the first game like that was for you? 
You know, I maybe because I came from reading and comics and stuff, the early Zork adventures mm. to me were things I spent a ton of Infocom games, if people remember those. And these are text, right? There's yeah. nothing on screen other than reading of the text. But this idea of an interactive adventure and kind of the extent to which I, I in my head perceived was there. In reality, when I played the game, like now looking back at Zorik, you kind of realize there's there's pathways that they send you down, and the amount of variability is there, but kind of not there to the extreme that was in my head. Um, but those are the games that that really got me going. And then a little bit maybe like your brother, and this is a total kind of 180. My dad and I would play Larry Bird versus Dr. J one on one basketball. And like there is no story. It's Larry Bird and Dr. J. And I've got a a one stick and one button controller like the old twenty six hundred controller. But the visceral feeling I had when I would hold that button and Dr. J would fade away. And as long as I was holding that button, he wouldn't let go until right at when I, you know, Larry Bird starts to drop and I let go of the button and the shot is made. And, you know, those connections where you feel such agency in the experience that it's like you're doing it, right? I'm not being led. This is something where uh, my impact on the experience and a little bit like your brother's why I bring up my dad, I also see gaming as a very communal thing and my best mm-hmm. experiences have always been played with other people. Yeah, for, for sure. Uh, they, it's so much more fun. Like even if you're not playing together, like having just a community watching, of talking. people where you yeah. just sort of talk. I, uh, and I, I'm not a super big gamer now, but uh, when I was in, grad school working on my PhD, uh, I lived with three other PhD students and they were video gaming. This was sort of PlayStation one yeah. generation. And sure. like they played an insane amount of Tomb Raider. Sure. Uh, yeah. And I was perfectly happy to sit there and watch them play Tomb Raider. Well, and what a great franchise because it's puzzle solving. Um, there is dexterity involved, but anytime you're playing a game where kind of everybody can contribute in the room. I just think it's it awesome. I'm playing way too much Elden Ring right now. Nice. Uh, great game from Miyazaki-san, a good friend. Um, and congrats to them on all the success that they've had. But it's interesting how often I'm in a party and we're all playing. It has some co-op capability, but usually we're all playing in parallel and just kind of talking to each other about the experience that we're had or, hey, I'm stuck somewhere. Can you kind come in and jump jump in and help? And I've always loved that part of gaming, if, whether it's the old BBSs I used to run from Computer Mart and people talking about games or the experience in the store. And now so much of that has gone online. Just the community around the content and the creation is uh, it's an integral part of, of what gaming is about. So. Yeah, maybe let's jump back to your uh, your time at University of Washington. So you um, you knew when you went to UW that you wanted to major in computer science or that was still up in the air? Like most things in my academic career, I had very little. I had no plan. Um, I, I, I graduated from a place called Ridgefield, Washington, down in Southern Washington High School. Uh, I applied to one school, University of Washington. I, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't go in and get in, but I, I, luckily I got in. My dad was an engineer, so he said, you're going to join. It's one of these schools where you kind of declare at the beginning and then after your sophomore year is when you apply to get into a school or not. So I said, okay, engineering. Uh, I My first, what was semester, I guess, they were on semester system. I learned what it meant to drop a class and still get a sub 3.0 grade point average. So I was quickly indoctrinated into, okay, this engineering requires real work, not just like my high school skate by. They had a class, I think it was called Engineering 101, where it was like a one credit class. You go, I believe, once a week and the different engineering disciplines would kind of come in and pitch what the what they were doing. Um, and CS was not part of um, the engineering discipline. Uh, at least at UW. And I ended up in graduating. My actual degree is in something called human centered design and engineering, the HCDE department at UW, and which is this mix of kind of human condition and code. 
um, and even hardware and the interaction between all of these things. When I was there, it was scientific and technical communication. It's changed names a couple of times. But I found that department through this Engineering 101 class. Um, and I just love the idea that we would be sitting there working on computers, building UI elements, writing code, um, and that that intersection of kind of the human condition and the capability of technology uh, was just so interesting to me. And that's the department I joined. And uh, four years later, I was I was done and uh, got offered a uh, software des- development engineer job at Microsoft after my two year internship. So what what was it like in those early days at Microsoft, either internship or full time engineer? So I, I I obviously wasn't there in the early days, and my uh, you know my my impression of what it was like has been through talking with folks like you who were actually there, and uh, there was this uh, famous Douglas Copeland book called Microsurfs yeah. uh, that <laughs> uh, yeah it, talking to a bunch of uh, Microsoft folks who were there at the time Copeland wrote the book, it sounds like it got some things right. Uh, um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of interested. I mean, it was a very different time and probably felt magical because this was like when Microsoft was on its uh, just really exponential rise, uh, mo- mostly because the personal computing ecosystem yeah. was on its exponential rise. Yeah, a little bit like my UW decision, University of Washington decision. Um, so Min Yi, who was the vice president in charge of Microsoft Press and the CD-ROM group, offered me this internship. And my choice was between going and joining or going back to Computer Mart for another summer, a job I loved. And his pitch to me, or the internship pitch, was at the end of summer, I get to keep my PC that I'm working on. And that's what flipped the bit for me and and had me join Microsoft uh, for that internship the first year. Because I was right across the bridge, um, I worked full time for the the first two years and I just kind of alternate my classes and where I was. In terms of the environment here, you know, it was, I'm going to guess, and I've, I've looked at this before, I think it was about 3,500 employees when I, I started my internship. And what are we now, like 200,000 or some yeah. crazy number like that? Um, it, I will say the similarities are mostly in name today, like comparing what it was like back then uh, to what it is today. But I will say it's still kind of an engineering led, product led uh, company. Back then, the transparency, everything, I, I had the full Windows install base or code base on my machine. Like I was doing compiles of the full system. I was working on GDI and some other things with some of the team. And the transparency inside the company it was kind of everybody, all hands uh, to get whatever we needed to get done. If, if you were a dev and you could write code, most people were definitely willing to kind of invite you into the code base. And there's good and bad in that, as you can imagine, in terms of quality and, and, and kind of practice and even supportability of the code that's written when so many different people are coming in. Um, you know, hours were, I, I, we were doing 80, 90 hours a week, 100 hours a week. Um, it was, but I was learning. I had amazing peers and mentors around me to review, not always the easiest when you're getting your code reviewed in those scenarios, but you know, I, I excelled at a rate faster. I couldn't imagine any other environment with the concentration um, and peer feedback that I have. What I, I was a little bit outside, and you could say I still am here in gaming at Microsoft. I was doing consumer CD-ROM, Encarta, Windows Bookshelf, these kind of things, DOS Bookshelf. Um, so I wasn't in kind of core DOS land or what was, it was pre Windows 3.0 or any of the precursors to Office. So we were a little bit of the ragtag group out on the sidelines, which meant some of the things that you read in like microservice and exposed to a lot of the core Microsoft were a little bit different than my experience. Um, but it was awesome just to see this company take feedback real time, look at opportunity real time and move, uh, and, we didn't get all the decisions right, clearly, um, but that eyes wide open, led from an engineering perspective, thinking about our products and our customers, uh, it's something that still sticks with me today. What you just described is what um, what I think folks are very lucky when they get to be a part of, uh, like particularly you know, being in this intense environment where you're working with really smart people, you are 
uh, you know, like trying to push some technical frontiers forward. Uh, and like you all, you know, ho hopefully you're sort of, you know, civil and compassionate or whatnot, but like you're also just sort of moving at a, at a rate where you just can't not give people feedback to help them get better about what it is they're doing. That's right. and, and like the learning that you can get in an environment like that is unbelievable. I remember this one story, um, and it's somebody who I still work with. His name's Kevin Gamble, and he was at the University of Washington when I was there, and we were interns at the same time, and we both still work together. But 34 years later, how crazy is that? And he's in the gaming org. But we were on the CD-ROM, in the CD-ROM group, and there was a company called Amdeck that made PC-based CD-ROMs, and they wanted to bundle DOS bookshelf with the CD-ROM when people purchased it. But they didn't have a device driver for the CD-ROM. So, and we literally had two months to port all of the old DOS bookshelf to kind of a new display engine that we had, write the device driver, which was going to have some impact on how our data was structured on the CD. Um, and it was Kevin and I. And it was Kevin and I with some of the kind of platform people that, that would help. But as you said, kind of any opportunity to make us more efficient between each other and not just in hours or lack of food, but actual the work that we're doing from a debugging standpoint, from a data prep standpoint, from a build timing standpoint, like we were doing the math. Because if, if we could cut an hour out of our build time, like what would that mean in this hyper concentrated, you've got two months to go get this thing done for you know some business deal at the end of it. And those experiences were just so eye opening. And then when you finally get it done um, and, you know, it's out in the market, I don't know, probably 10,000 people use the thing in the end. But, um, you know, there was something magical about that feedback loop of actually seeing customers use the product um, that you had built that just, again, reinforced the whole loop about if you can spend more time in the creation on the things that really matter to your customers, uh, you get so much more value out of that. And just looking at your your production pipeline through that lens, I just found was was really, really helpful for us. Well, and, you know, which brings me to this, uh, you know, this thing about you and, and what you have chosen to do, which is you, you get to make things that you put in people's hands and the objective of them using it is their enjoyment. Uh, yeah. And so... You know, you can tell whether you've done a good job or not. Uh, like people either enjoy the thing that you've made or they, they don't. Uh, they either play it a lot or they don't. Uh, they either, you know, like talk about it positively or they don't. Um, and, and that is, you know, different than sometimes people who do infrastructure things. Yeah. Like yeah. I, yeah, I, I've been a systems person most of my career and, and you have to figure out other ways to determine whether or not the things you're working on are, are creating value or like serving a good purpose. Um, so how, how important is that to you as a engineer, like being, ha having that feedback loop? For me, kind of personally and professionally, it is really my only way of operating is both from like a, a personal fulfillment. And I'm not it's not at all a judge of any kind of engineering out there. It's just kind of how I'm wired. The, uh, I mean, you know this because I, I, you and I have, have been online before. You know, I'm, I'm P3 on Xbox Live. When I'm playing online, people see my gamer tag. I don't, I don't hide it. Um, my Twitter handle is out there. Like you said, the feedback on the work that we do, good and bad, uh, is is out there front and center. And while there's obviously good days and, and bad days for, for myself um, and the teams and the products that we're building, for me, that complete loop of we have an idea, whether it's iterative on something that we've already done or, or completely new, we're going to work that over multiple years in the case of these big games that we were talking about. Uh, to to deliver something and that end result in the feedback that you get uh, is the thing that gives me momentum into the next thing. Um, but that's, like I said, that's, that's kind of how I'm wired. Um, I like the completeness of that. I mean, I mean, I'm enthralled by 
you know, I, I think of like, you think four, three, 400 years ago, there's like architects in Europe working on these massive churches that are going to take 200 years to build. And they're in the middle of this. And if you're like a Mason, you know that you didn't see the beginning and your life will not exist. You won't live long enough to see the end. And these people throw themselves into these builds. And we have similar kind of projects at Microsoft, as you know, that take like multiple, multiple decades, um, especially some of these things where they're way out there, Horizon 3 things. And I am just so impressed by people that have that amount of kind of intellectual um, drive to see through it. For me, that that tighter feedback loop is is just part of how I'm wired. Um, and I'm glad we have those people that can think longer term about infrastructure and um, and longer term investments. Um, it's not just longer term, but kind of uh, it's it's at a different level in the stack. Um, the things that we do and the conversations. One of the reasons I always love having conversations with you because the conversations of how different people think about these these problems and opportunities uh, are, are are just awesome feedback into what we do. Yeah. Well, but so. You know, that said, you are managing a bunch of things that take multiple years to go do. Yeah. So there's both infrastructure things like xCloud, for instance, and there's also like these games, which are, you know, like a AAA game is a thousand people worth of complexity working over yeah. multiple years. So how how do you manage that? Um, yeah, it might be obvious to someone just getting into the field, like how you go – you know, do your two month project where you, uh, you know, you're you're porting this uh, <laughs> this books project for a new CD ROM format yeah. and writing. It. But like a thousand people for three years to like get to the to the thing where you start getting the feedback. Like, how does how does that work? Yeah, it's been real learning for me, just being transparent on this. Like the biggest one of these things is I moved into this job ahead of Xbox, which is now eight years ago, which is kind of crazy to think about, is hardware. Like the hardware timelines as a software, as somebody who grew up in software, it's not only is it the timeline on hardware, but when you find a bug, the kind of loop to go back and fix a problem um, until you get your next EV build of hardware. And as you said, longer term platform things that we're obviously doing on Xbox has been a real learning. Uh, I, I grew up at Microsoft prior to the head of Xbox. I was head of our studios organization, so building games. And I think for me, when you have the portfolio of things going on, you kind of just daisy chained people like your games in your head of, OK, every year we're going to have three or four or five releases and I'll get my endorphin hit from those things knowing that the things that will come the following year probably have been in development for three or four years. Um, and that that kind of just that that portfolio of, of things, different stages were very useful. When I came into this job and, and took on the, the hardware requirement, the platform work, having some ideas like Game Pass and xCloud, which we xCloud being our cloud streaming, Game Pass being our gaming subscription that we had to invest in over time. Um, it was learning for me both as a leader and as a member of the team on on how to just structure my my thinking differently, finding people on the team that had that capability beyond what I did, listening and learning. And it, it's just been part of my growth in this role over the years. The thing that I never um, really appreciated until I was working on my Ph.D. is like the role that stamina plays in trying to do something complicated uh, where you know, you. you you have to have some framework for how you're going to break a big problem down into like a bunch of manageable chunks. And then you've got to have the stamina to just go do all of the chunks uh, until you're you're finished. Uh, and like I, I know I mean, you, you basically are working on 100 PhDs uh, at, at once, uh, given the complexity of all of the things that are in the pipeline. And, and it must be a interesting thing helping all of those teams uh, like maintain that focus and and having the stamina to get everything done. Yeah, and I think your point about decomposing the problem a bit and making it digestible and, and more meaningful kind of chunks of time than five, six, seven years is really, really useful. The other thing I'd say, and this is different, like we're kind of an anomaly inside of Microsoft and maybe even gaming and tech, though I think VCs, this probably resonates a little more, is we are a, a kind of portfolio business we're going to ship 10 things. All of them might have been kind of these very expensive, very long endeavors that we've talked about. 
And you might have two or three of them that you would earmark as success at the end of that. That's just kind of entertainment, right? Whether you're writing a book, making a movie, making an album, your hit rate 20, 30, maybe 40% if you're kind of crazy good is what the hit rate is for most at scale publishers. And yet you're sitting inside of Microsoft with kind of tried and true franchises like Windows and Office and now growing in Azure. And there is a little bit of an impedance mismatch when you're walking in and you're showing this portfolio of things and you might get the obvious question of, okay, which ones of these are going to work? Um, and you can't rank it by budget. You can't rank it by time or by what's hot today. Um, and, you know, that's, I'd say, a, a, another change or another difference. You've got this longevity kind of opportunities you talk about and how you break down the problem. And then at the end of these things, making every team feel like they succeeded, knowing that most of your teams are likely going to be in a, a situation where they didn't hit their their own goals and, and expectations. And that stamina that you talk about has to not only live inside of the existing project, but you hope that coming out of a, a, another project, regardless of the outcome, there's a slingshot into more stamina for the next thing that you want a team to go do. And and so related to that, like, how do you get people to continue to take creative risk when the risks that they may have taken last time didn't pay off the way that they wanted it to? Yeah, I mean, one thing is the industry will do it, right? It's we're in an industry just like you know technology for Microsoft that you're either kind of moving forward or you're moving backward relative to the expectations of our customers. Uh, we have very few customers, even taking the original Zelda game that you loved, it's still a great game today. But if it launched in the sea of games that are out there today, and you and your brother went and picked that up, it you know it's going to have a different equation to that game becoming as successful. You'll still have your Minecrafts and things of the day that aren't about how many pixels can we go push per, uh, per second on screen. But um, when you're, so the industry will set the bar for the teams and our teams are very, very, uh, consumptive in terms of what our art form is about and, and where the bar is. But it is true like that after something launches, you have to, you, you want to sit back and be transparent with the teams, both about what went well and what did not in terms of our own process and then what we learned so that you have more momentum in the next thing. One thing I've learned in, in my role is for me to be very transparent about my own journey um, and the areas where I succeed and the areas that I, I fail, you know, and um, every day, every day I make some decisions that are good or do some things that are in, and every day I make some mistakes. And, you know, Satya likes to talk about growth mindset, which I think is an important kind of framework here of it's not about doing the perfect thing every single time, every single day. It's about on this journey of growth and, and reflection and learning. And so for myself, when I'm working with the teams, I, I, I try to be transparent about my own learnings and my leadership team. I think they they reflect that as well. Um, but th that's a cultural thing that you have to start very early on because people in the end, what you're really looking for is teams that feel safe. Yeah. Right? They feel safe taking the risk. Um, and that like there's so many facets to what makes a team feel safe in today's world. Yeah, I had two different uh, bosses a long time ago that that had two pieces of feedback for me that were uh, like pretty pivotal. One was uh, like, if you're not failing uh, sometimes, like you're probably not trying hard enough. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I had another boss where, you know, God, God knows I have, uh, I've made many, many mistakes. And so, you know, like in the ad systems uh, that I've run in the past, uh, you know, a, a system outage could mean, millions of dollars of revenue yeah. an hour that you're losing. And every time one of those things would happen, uh, I had this boss who would uh, say, well, you know, be very calm in the moment, like get the problem fixed and then make sure that you're getting your K million dollars worth of learning out of this uh, out of this episode, because each yeah. one of them teaches you something. That's exactly right. I think it's very good learning. I a friend of mine runs a, a company called Supercell uh, that does a game called Clash Royale, Clash of Clans back in the day. Mm -hmm. 
And he used to, when teams would set goals and ship, and if they had great success, he would take them all down to the local pub and they'd all have a beer. When teams didn't have reached their goals, he'd take them down and they'd all have champagne, trying to create this idea that setting that bar high and hitting the goal, goals uh, or exceeding the goals is always a special moment. But the outcome is actually in many ways decoupled from the effort. We put our best and, and best people and most effort into some of the things that didn't work. And to try not to create a direct causality between here, like all of the serendipity that goes in to making something a hit. Why is Minecraft a hit, right? Why when Marcus puts up Minecraft as this Java XE on a server, or, you know, you can look at something like a Roblox or a Fortnite. I mean, trying to excelize the success of, of in, in kind of human entertainment is so, so difficult. And um, yeah, I, I think that those are words of wisdom yeah. your boss was giving you. Well, so, you know, let's talk a little bit more about your career. So you, you've been, you've been at Microsoft for 34 years uh, and obviously it's worked out really well for you. Um do you have any advice for folks about how to how to grow professionally when they are, you know, sticking with a company for a long time or, or like maybe even if they're not like you, you must have had some sort of uh, theory of career, uh, you know, given where you've gotten right. You know, the things I can look back on and say, what are those critical moments or decisions that have led me to what I think is you know, the, uh, just an amazing opportunity I have here leading the gaming org with an amazing team. One is just the power of, of human connections and, and also being conscious makes me reflect on something sideways to that or related is the, the power of privilege in some of those connections and how others might not have them and how I want to lead and ensure that I'm opening up as many connections as it, for as many people as possible. But when I look back on like forks in the road for me at my Microsoft career and what kept me here, what kept me motivated, it was usually around my connection to people who I wasn't working with directly at the time and somebody just reaching out and saying, hey, you should give this a try. You should look at this. Here's an interesting opportunity. And um, and it's, it's really stuck with me that through my career, uh, I I love to make those connections with people, to listen to their journey, to keep those connections as warm as I can, not as any kind of strategy on what my, my next job might be. But when I reflect back on it, so many of the career steps that I've had um, have been about knowing somebody and the connection uh, and that being kind of a first step in a multi-step journey to kind of taking the career step. And the, the other two things I'll say quickly, uh, Almost every job I've taken, I think I can say every job, including that original internship, I was not prepared for. Um, and I've just kind of learned that even when this head of Xbox job like in, in came open through a process of attrition, everybody else kind of left and I was here. Um, the imposter syndrome that I have walking out on an E3 stage or leading teams, talking about hardware, something I didn't at the time know much about. Um, but kind of preparing yourself for those moments that this the serendipity of of, of luck meets connection meets as I said some kind of the privilege that's there at the time um, I, I just encourage people to bet on themselves when they're ready and when those opportunities come jump and like I said every decision I've ever made on my career I, I felt like a year or two earlier than I should have done it um, and in hindsight some of them were. Uh, but other people were making decisions to bet, and and all I could do was prepare myself as as openly as I could and be transparent about my my journey in that role. Yeah, I think that's really really good advice. Um, I mean, for for what it's worth, like I I think I've had the same experience as you. Uh, like I feel imposter syndrome all the time. Like what 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 qualifies me to do the job that I'm doing? Um, and I've always felt it from the time that I was a kid, but I, I also, I also have always had this, uh, um, it's not even overconfidence. It's like just crazy curiosity. It's like, I just can't help myself, but like yeah. go see what the thing is going to be like. Uh, 
And so I, I think, you know, whatever it is, like that is uh, what, what you just gave people is really good advice. Like find that thing inside of you to overcome your imposter syndrome or your hesitancy or your, you know, you don't feel worthy or prepared and just go do it. And I, I think it's, it, it's so spot on. And what I have found, I mean, and you're such a great example of this, like what, five years ago, you and I didn't even know each other. Um, and now I consider you one of my good friends here at this company. And everybody in every position at, at the base level is a human and has human emotion about their uh, where they are. They've got friends and family connections that kind of are, are such a part of who they are and their makeup, their history, what they want to accomplish. Um, and those feelings that you have as an individual about whether it's imposter or I'm not ready or, um, you know, we've all been in the same position and might be <laughs> even at that time. And I love how open we've been able to have at, at, at kind of Microsoft on these these types of, of topics. Finding a place where you can have safe conversations, yeah. um, I've also found is, is, is very helpful. Yeah, for sure. Like finding your people where you can just be yourself. Super that's important. Right. That's right. And 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 th that's maybe goes back to that connection. Those might not be people that you work directly with every day, um, but having that that the, whether it's you know, my wife and I have been married 31 years. We went to high school together, and I've often said, Kelly, when I'm standing on stage at E3, she'll say, Hey, I remember you as that 17 year old <laughs> with a mullet driving your Ford Pinto. So don't think you're all that. Um, but those people to kind of connect you back to to being. Uh, human um, and fallible and and on on your own journey. Yeah, I, th I think that's critically important. It has yeah. been for me. Absolutely. Yeah, I could not agree more. So we're almost out of time. The last question I like to ask everyone and this may be a hard one for you, uh, given that <laughs> you are maybe the best mix of uh, like career and uh, personal I've ever seen like you you sort of do what you love uh but but so uh in your spare time <laughs> well, what do you enjoy doing other than gaming which I know you do a lot <laughs> <laughs> and snowboarding and and reading my comics um you know I what I have found is I just enjoy it's kind of what you were talking about that that learning process um and you know, the reason I love snowboarding is because I still think I'm fairly mediocre at it. I go up every weekend with some people that are a lot better than me and I, I challenge. But I will say the thing that's becoming more and more a part of my lives is my my two daughters. And as they go into their adult years, um, they're 26 and 23. And just seeing them kind of having, frankly, the same conversation that you and I are having now as they're charting their path uh, is so, so awesome. Like, it's just, and I... I have an infinite amount of time for them and and the journey that they're on. They're much better humans than I will ever be. Um, you know that we've talked about what they're doing and um, and I there's there's just so special. Like I said, Kelly and I have been together for forever, and seeing where our daughters are going and they don't always make all the decisions we would make, and they go through the same learning journey that we were just talking about. Uh, but it's it's just it's it's special, right? It's it's special to see um, people who are so important to you um, finding their own path. And as, as somebody who's older and seen a few county fairs to give some direction when I can, um, has it's just, it's become a really important part of my life. It obviously was for so many years, but now as they're adults um, more so, and it's, it's awesome. That's super cool, man. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. This has been a great conversation. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate you doing these. Really, congrats. I look, I went by, I watched these. I listened to the, like all the guests that you've had. You know, fantastic job. Really good. Oh, thank you so much. Well, that was Kevin's conversation with Phil Spencer. And oh my gosh, I could have listened to the two of you talk for a, another couple of hours. I'm not even joking. Like I would, I would watch or, or listen to an ongoing conversation with the two of you. There's so much interesting things um, that I got from that. But the thing I wanted to start with, Kevin, you know, over the last four-ish years or however long we've been doing this podcast, one of the common themes um, for so many of the technologists that you've talked to has been that they got into and interested in computing through video games. And I know that that's similar for, for you and I as well. And that's also was kind of a similar origin story for Phil. I'm curious, like, what do you think that it is about games that 
pulls people in and makes them want to explore other parts of of technology, whether it's whether it's computing or, or hardware or um, you know even like like you know uh, biotech. W- what do you think it is about gaming that really has been that kind of draw for so many people over at this point so many decades? Yeah, I they are really special things. Um, I, I think you know one of the things for me at least is they are or were the really first engaging technical things that I encountered. Um, so, you know, when I was little, uh, you know, the, the things that I was obsessed with before video games were books and comic books and science fiction. And, uh, you know, they were all things that sort of uh, let me escape the world that I was in and, like, enter this world of imagination. And video games were just like all of that turned up to another level. And as soon as I had played a video game on a computer and realized that it was just the thing that someone else had made, I was dying to understand how they worked. Um, and, and I think it's just a powerful hook for folks who are sort of curious about the things that engage them. Uh, and I see it with my y- youngest daughter, who at 11 years old is also just completely and utterly obsessed with uh, today's video games and, uh, you know, has, has you know, taken some classes in programming already at 11 years old uh, because uh, and she can't really figure out whether the way that she's going to engage with video games is by learning to code so she can make them herself or by becoming a streamer or an influencer, you know, YouTuber or TikToker. Um, But but like it's just amazing to me what video games do for people that like make them want to like invest in them beyond just the playing of the game. Yeah, no, I I think about that too, and and I think that if I were eleven years old now and not the undisclosed age that I am now, I would be a lot like your daughter, and I would be trying to figure out, okay, I know I, I want to do something with this. Um, and I think you're right. I think there's it has that that at that pull it takes you into something else rather than just being a participant where you want to be a creator too. I wanted to ask you, you know, you and Phil talk about so many things, and both of you actually, I think, are really interesting in that you have very strong like technical backgrounds uh, and engineering things, but you've gone on to be um, managers and, and, and business leaders. What do you think? I, I guess you know, speaking for yourself a little bit, and I know you know Phil too. What was it, I guess, when did you decide that you wanted to kind of make that sort of transition into thinking not just about the things that you're building, but also about the way that the businesses are run? Um, you know, Phil was talking about how thinking about the the business model is, is a pretty core component to, to gaming, to building games, which I thought was interesting. But I'm curious from your perspective, like, when did you kind of make that switch in your mind from just wanting to focus on the tech to also thinking about some of the bigger business challenges and, and opportunities? Yeah, I it was a really super clear moment for me. I I just realized uh over a short period of time that the interesting things that we were making with technology were so complicated that there was zero hope that one person was going to build an interesting thing all by themselves. You know, it's still possible like single single creators do all sorts of uh, interesting things, but like a lot of the stuff that runs their world is the the effort of lots and lots and lots of people working on things for long periods of time. Um, and I, I like I, I made my decision to become a manager when I was at Google and I just sort of looked around me and we were hiring all of these people. Um, so I, I helped start uh, Google's New York engineering office. Uh, like, I think it was the 10th engineer there. Like my boss, Craig Neville Manning had, uh, actually started the office and I was there, uh, at the, at the early stages. And we were hiring all of these really great people from Bell Labs and from, um, you know, from investment banks and what, and just, and they were better engineers than I was. I was a pretty good engineer, but like we were hiring people that were like, so, so much technically better than I was. And like some of the people who were my computer science heroes uh, who, who worked at Bell Labs. And I decided that maybe the thing that I could do for them is to help organize the effort that they were uh, undertaking so that they could have as much impact as humanly possible. 
I, and like it was just this crystal clear moment and I was like okay well I, I I am probably going to be of more service to the people around me by helping to lead them than I will be uh, trying to be one among them as a uh, uh, you know just another uh, engineer who's not quite as good as they are. No, that makes sense. I have one more question for you. Um, I know that you told uh, Phil that like you don't have you know time to kind of play games like you used to, but have you been playing any games? Is there any games that you've you've picked up in the last year or so that you've had fun with? I I tend to play these games where I know they don't take much time. So I am embarrassed to say the very first thing that I have to do every morning is I play uh, I play Wordle. I play yes. the uh, the New York Times Spelling Bee and. Uh, like occasionally I'll do the uh like the little short daily uh yeah. daily uh crosswords uh and, and I'm very disappointed in myself when I uh <laughs> when I uh when I take more than five or more than four uh, guesses to get the word in wordle uh like I track my distribution uh mm -hmm. uh like crazy <laughs> uh, same I same here I actually I'm one of the weird people who like I tend to go to bed after midnight and so the thing that I go to bed to every night is I, I play Wordle and then I'm like, all right, the new Wordle's out, I can play. And then I, I, I go to bed either happy with myself or or a little bit annoyed and like, all right, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to get it in, in, in three or, or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. But the last like real, real video game that I enjoy playing is I bought um, uh, Minecraft Dungeons uh, mm -hmm. for my kids to play and I wound up playing it more than they did just because <laughs> it was so fun. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, um, that does it for today's show. Thank you again to Phil Spencer for joining us. And if um, you have anything that you would like to share with us, you can email us at behindthetech at microsoft.com. And remember, you can now follow us over on YouTube as well for full video episodes of Behind the Tech. So if you want to see the, the video version of this great conversation with uh, Kevin and Phil, be sure to check that out. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next time.